OCB Way is the sponsor of today's video and they were kind enough to put together some of my Bluetooth amplifier boards which were used in this speaker build today. If you sign up you can get $5 off your first order and I put the link down in the description below. All right, I'm Johnny Reader and this is JCR Acoustics. Today I'm going to be walking through the entire Fidelity build, starting with this here. This is my friend's CNC machine that he put together himself. I'm going to be doing a collab with him and his channel Vosfer very soon, so look out for that. But uh, he put these parts together for me based off of my CAD on SolarWorks. There were a few things I had to tweak, but that was more to do with me missing things when I was designing it but that's just sort of how it is with the prototyping process. So I think a lot of this video is gonna be me demonstrating how uh, not to do things, but I'm also hoping it will demonstrate that you don't need a fully kitted out workshop in order to build something fairly complex. So using my Dremel here just to part off the pieces that uh, need to be finished off from the CNC and then rounding the edges uh, with a router tool. So once I'd had all my parts prepped and sort of ready to glue up, I started cutting off pieces just to pull it taut when I was gluing up. One of the, the sort of biggest things that I missed was uh, just including housing joints to keep all of the parts together and keep them square when I was gluing up. Uh, so you see me here, I'm just kind of marking out where they need to be glued. Uh, and it causes me a lot of issues. The, the thing twisted a lot and it meant I had to do a lot of planing afterwards. So definitely on the next one uh, in the design, include housing joints and probably save quite a few hours on the, the gluing and the processing afterwards. It was quite difficult to glue up um, because of the, the lack of those joints. The, the thing did slide around and I actually came back here with a knife and broke one of the, the joints here before it had a chance to dry just so I could pull it slightly more square. Otherwise, I would have had a real planing job on my hands to, to get it all flush. So a uh, bit of a mess. Coming in a few hours later and just checking how it all glued up, probably despairing at how a lot of it are twisted. Uh, with MDF as well, if you don't use housing joints, you, you're only gluing onto that top surface and it's it's quite easy to break it away. It's, it's not a particularly strong material. So I just uh, piloted some holes in, and put some wood screws in. And I'm just filling that in with some MDF and glue so it's flush when I come to paint it at the end. I had to add this little trim piece here as it was slightly too short at the back and I wanted the top to glue on completely flush. Day two is mostly a day of planing because I didn't have those housing joints and the thing twisted I needed to plane to bring everything flush and square. You'll see me come in with a ruler just to make sure it was all sort of sitting flat and that meant that it would sit inside the main frame when I came to glue it on later. So you can see me going across looking for any gaps and then just planing away any area that needs finishing. As well, where my PCB fits in, I needed to leave cable uh, slots. So I'm using the Dremel again to route these. And I'm gonna be filling them in with silicone as well because you don't want any air gaps uh, when the speaker's playing. So it's gonna cause chuffing and weird noises, uh, which you don't really want. So because none of these mitres are 45 degrees, it's really hard to clamp it in any kind of way. So it's all I'm using is tape. And as long as you kind of tape it tight, it, it glues up pretty well. So you'll see, I'm just checking if the carcass is sitting in correctly and if it's going far back enough. Had to trim off a little bit more just to get it slide in all the way. And I actually end up using the torch on my phone to see if there's any sort of high spots, which is causing it to not move in. Looks like a pretty uh, messy gluing process here, but if anything, I could have used more glue just because there were some gaps left around. I actually filled the entire speaker around the edges with silicone at the end, just because you don't want any spaces where air is going to leak. This is a ported design, but obviously you've designed to use that port and let the air out of that. So you don't want to introduce any other spots uh, which weren't meant to be there. Day three is largely a day of prepping for paint. So just sanding with 120 grit, putting those uh, corners, those filleted edges on by hand and taking my time with it. I got them pretty even and looking pretty good. At this early prepping stage, I'm happy to use the orbital sander on edges like this. I'm just making sure I'm not putting too much pressure and accidentally rounding anything over. Um, but certainly when we come to sanding back between layers of paint, you don't want to be using the orbital on edges like that. 
again just using 120 grit and uh, not taking too long here because uh, we're just going to be laying down some primer on top of this I ended up with some gaps along some of the edges, so I just used some MDF and glue to fill them in, waited for it to dry, and then sanded them back off so it was nice and rounded, ready for paint to be applied. All right, day number four. So this front piece is made from MDF, and I am going to be replacing it with oak, so I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on it, but I did want to plane it back so it dropped in and was easy to remove without scuffing up the paint when it was finished. Uh, but if you're wondering about my process with the clamps on this wheelie trolley here, I think so was I. Um, but there you go. That's what happens when you don't have a workshop. You get a lot of sawdust on your potatoes. And I really don't show how long this took me. It took me way longer than it would have if I'd have had a proper bench vice. So much so that I was excited to film the point where it finally dropped in place. As I say, I will be replacing this with oak and I'll probably be making that pattern slightly deeper and more pronounced, but for now, it will certainly do the job. Whilst I wasn't looking for a perfect finish here, I just wanted to see how easy it was to remove the machining marks from the CNC. And uh, there were some changes that I had to make to this piece. So I hadn't included any space for the cables to move through the woofers. And so that will all be changed on the final oak piece. Finally ready to lay down some primer. This is a water-based Leyland white primer specifically for MDF and I'm just mixing it so I can get the right flow rate. This is I think a 35 pound spray gun I bought from Amazon and I borrowed a compressor from work. I appreciate not everyone has access to that but it certainly gives a good finish. And I, I use a cardboard box to make sure I've got the right spread pattern. You can see I'm doing two passes per coat and that's just because MDF's really absorbent so on the primer coats so you're fine to do that. And it lays down real nice, so no issues there. On the front piece, I think it's probably the angle I'm spraying and the fact that there were still machine marks, but I had to do quite a lot of paint just to get a decent coverage. And I wasn't too fussed because I knew I was going to be swapping this guy out. Day number five, I think I give up with the paper after this one. But uh, what you didn't see there is I did sand the whole thing back with 600 grit just a bit before I applied the base coat. I'm using an oil-based black gloss paint. Totally bought the wrong thing here. I should have bought another water-based paint because it took five days to dry between each layer. And I also had to uh, mix it and clean it with white spirit, which is just a real mess compared to a water-based. Cleaning it off with some isopropanol alcohol, making sure it's nice and clean, and then coming around with a gun and just doing one pass per layer. And I had the wrong consistency here. It was way too thick and I've just got a horrible spray pattern. For that reason as well, I overcompensated in some areas and I ended up with streaks running down it. I could have got away with just one coat of this, but for that reason, I had to sand it back and, and do another one. So a uh, bit of a time-wasted exercise, but lesson learned. This is the finish you get using that paint. I mean, if you were doing a simple box build, you might be happy just leaving it like this. I didn't need to buy a glossy paint. That was my mistake. The gloss comes from using clear coat and sanding and buffing that. But if it wasn't obvious already, I, I am winging this whole thing from start to finish. So because I had some streaks and bits where the paint had run, I did sand it all back, ready to do another layer. And this could have been avoided, but um, it was worth it in the end. I got a good finish. <laughs> One thing not to do is to adjust the speed of your orbital sander and then put it on the workpiece. You're supposed to fire the thing up already touching or you end up scuffing it like this. But uh, at least I'm doing another coat, right? <laughs> and at this point, I kind of had a screw it attitude. I was just uh, just wanted it to all be flush, ready for the next layer. So I did go too far on some of these spots and you can see where I've gone back through to the primer. Cleaning it off again with some isopropanol alcohol, ready to do the next layer. I made this batch a lot thinner, so it sprays down nice. And because I've already got that initial black color underneath it, it's much easier. You're not trying to cover up white. You can see the sun really didn't want to play ball. I think it was just uh, every time I came out to paint, it knew it and it <laughs> rain was just around the corner. And you can see me kind of pause here because I feel a bit high and realize I've not put on a mask. Especially with an oil-based paint, you really want to be wearing a proper HEPA filter. Uh, which is why I then stop 
Uh, con considering it. Oh, I, no. Yeah, okay. you, use your personal protection. If you can smell the paint, it means it's not working properly. Again, I, I probably should have had a proper HEPA filter, but this, this seemed to do a pretty good job, and I am outside after all. And here's one of those moments where it really was about to start raining, so I had to quickly bring the thing inside. And being in the UK, you don't get too many bugs flying around, but it does seem as soon as they smell some paint, they're all over it, so for that reason as well. All right, day number um, whatever at this point, I'm going to be laying down some clear coat, and I use polycrylic here which is, I really, really liked using this stuff. It's water-based again, so it dried really quickly. And I just thinned it out with uh, the tiniest bit of water to get it to spray. You can find all the ratios and everything online. And I'll put links in the description to all the items I used. And with polycrylic, you can uh, lay down multiple coats in quick succession. So I did four coats here with about 15 minutes space between them. And the reason you want to put so much on is because you're going to sand a lot of this back to get it flush before buffing it up. And that's how you end up with that mirror finish. And you can see it lays down real nice. Um, one of the issues I had actually was it just seemed maybe I was running at too many PSI because I seemed to be wasting a lot of it. You can see it's spraying off everywhere. But for the most part, it was uh, pretty clean. So to show you how I'm doing the spray pattern, I'm spraying the gun before I hit the piece and continuing afterwards. This way you get a nice even finish, kind of moving your arm across the whole line, but then flicking with your wrist on either side uh, when you get to the ends. All right, so this is a couple of days later. I probably dried within uh, 24 hours, but I left it over the weekend anyway, just to be sure. And you can see it's got a nice sheen to it, but it's not uh, fixing to look how it's going to finally end up. We've got to sand this back until we get a nice flat layer. We don't want any uh, bumps or uh, orange peel, as it's called. And then we're going to buff it up. And at that point, it's going to it's going to look like glass. So you can see I've tried to level it out here so the water doesn't just run off the back. And then I think I'm using 1200 grit here. And I'm just going to go in linear motion. So you do a cross hatch, you go one way, and then you'll see me come back the other way. And you do that maybe three, four times. Oh, and um, if you're doing this inside, don't lift up the uh, the sander whilst it's spinning and flick uh, water everywhere like I did. And I really took my time here. I didn't spend too long sanding before I'd then wipe it back and check how far I was getting. Because at this stage, if you uh, hit an edge, you can very easily burn through the clear coat and the base coat and uh, expose the white underneath. So just taking my time, not pressing too hard, just using the weight of the sander and making sure there's lots of water. And those streaks you see running down the side, that's uh, that's actually clear coat. So you're, you're sanding away the clear coat and it's getting caught up in the water. Definitely don't want to be using the orbital on edges like this at this point. So just using some 1200 grit and going along. <laughs> I made a, made a real mess of the kitchen. I had a towel on the floor. Um, but there's no real easy way to hit these sides without doing it, you know, on the side. So this is how it kind of ended out. And you can see the closer it gets to being perfectly smooth, the more shiny it gets. So once you're getting away that orange peel, you're getting it to a point where it's flat and there's no more high spots. And I'm just checking carefully each time, making sure that I've really got it smooth. And you can see here, there's still a lot of specs where um, I haven't quite cut through far enough. So just doing it a few more times. And this probably shows best the technique I was using. So just going up and down and then side to side, just going Ariana Grande style and hitting the spots that I'd sort of looked at and seen was still um, needed the most work. But it's really getting there now. You can see that kind of glass effect. So finally, after you've sanded it all smooth and flat, here I am the next day just cleaning it off with some isopropanol again and getting it ready to apply the buffing solution. So the buffing solution I used, I'll put a link down in the description. Probably wasn't the best I could have. It was just one my uh, brother-in-law happened to have, so he kindly lent some to me. And it's typically used on boats or um, car paint if you're just trying to get a good shine. Just uh, put a dot and space it evenly around. And with the buffing wheel, you want to give a decent amount of pressure because you're trying to cut that solution into the paintwork to get that shine. I'm using a thick foam pad here, so it's fairly soft. And I'm just applying it in that linear motion, so up and down, side to side. 
repeating it probably four or five times before wiping it off and then seeing if I need to do another coat. Typically do around two to three coats and, and that was getting it where it needed to be. So it's a fairly difficult process to mess up, but you still want to be careful you're not putting too much force or going at an RPM that's too high. The manufacturer will normally say what to use with the paste because if you go too hard, then you can uh, actually burn through your paint and then you're, uh, you're back to square one. There are a couple of really small areas on edges where um, I did actually go too far and uh, I cheated and used the Sharpie to cover those up. But um, I think that's just part of the learning process. So if I was to do it again, it you just got to be fairly careful. So you saw again there, I just dotted some of the paste around before firing up the buffing wheel. And it's kind of safe to use on edges like this. Again, just making sure I'm not applying too much force and I don't accidentally just clip it on an edge and burn through. And you can see it's really starting to look good now. You can see the reflection of the buffing wheel. Um, so getting pretty happy with it. Got uh, to the point where we're emotionally invested, just wiping random edges just so you can really appreciate the shine. I had a bit of trouble applying pressure through the sides because it just wanted to slide across the table. So yeah, standard low tech solution of putting a big concrete flower pot on the table seemed to do the job. And looking at how the table is vibrating now, perhaps a, a glass rusted table wasn't, wasn't the best, but it held up, so we'll take it. Here we are finally ready to put all the electronics inside and fire the thing up for the first time. I think I thought this was going to be a quick, uh, quick little process, but as with all these things, it ended up taking way longer than I thought. So I was up to about one or two, but I was too far gone to stop. So all of the PCBs are ones that I've designed. and I'll do a video in a lot more detail on those later on. But um, my sponsor, PCB Way, were kind enough to put them together for me. And so here we are just uh, wiring everything in. That's a, a off the shelf Meanwell power supply and it's gonna deliver the 24 volts our amplifier needs. And this here is a touch control board. So it's got these little touch pads and that does our volume up, down, next track, play pause. And uh, you wanna be careful of not chipping the paint job by forcing anything, which is exactly what I did here. But what are you gonna do? So I will be putting clear perspex over both the control board and the amplifier but that will be coming when we do the oak front piece with Phosphor next month. Wiring in the PCB was a bit finicky, um, but nothing too difficult there. I've got just simple terminal blocks to do the speakers. And this thing's also able to run on battery, so uh, wiring in the lithium ion. And it's got smart charging, so it will trickle charge and know when the battery's all finished. And as well, if you plug in a power supply, it will auto switch between where it gets its source from. So you can run it off the AC adapter whilst it's charging or just run it on battery and there will never be an interruption in playback. So these are passive crossovers. That's going to basically take our audio signal from the left right channels and then split it out into the individual tweeter and woofer. And I could have done an active crossover, but I wanted to be able to use the amplifier designed in other projects as well. And the crossover point on this one is 2,750 hertz. So we're using a C's 27 TDFC tweeter, which is a great budget tweeter. And for the woofer, we're using a Tang Bang or Tang Band uh, five inch. I'll, I, again, I'll link them in the description. And there's great free software you can use for simulating different things. So I used, I think it's called VTOIX CAD to work over the crossover points for the drivers. And then I used WinISD when I was simulating how to do the enclosure. So as I said, this is a ported design. And because it's quite small, it can sometimes be lacking in the base department. But by tuning it to give more of an amplification an octave higher, you're kind of able to mitigate that. And this will quite happily shake a room when you uh, crank it up. And I, I used my 3D printer to print some flanged ports. And uh, they came out really nice, actually. And obviously, when you 3D print it, you can design it to be any length you want and get it exactly how you want it to be. 
So you can see those woofers going in there. They're uh, they're pretty heavy. I think that's something like six kilos a piece. And uh, I'm not gluing the front on because, as I said, I do want to remove it. But when I bring in the oak, I will be gluing it so I get a nice tight seal. But here I'm just using the screws around the driver to hold that in place. I'm just going around with some sticky sided foam. This is going to create a nice tight seal with the base plate, which I've had made. So this is a custom six millimeter aluminium base plate. I was going to get it anodized, but it's quite expensive and it's going to sit on the bottom anyway. So on this prototype, at least I'll, I'll be leaving it. And it just screws down in place. So I put some wood inserts in the MDF already before I even painted it. So they were ready to go. And these are those custom ports I was talking about. And you can see they're flanged. They've got a smaller cross section in the middle and they kind of flange outwards on either side. And that helps with standing waves when you're producing a port. And they're uh, quite tight, just push fit. But then I've added some screws as well, just to make sure they, they don't rattle or anything like that. And of course, the all important logo. I've got a, a good friend of mine who's uh, got a business. They, they make special custom pins for saddles and they're called IDX Limited if you're interested in that. But they were kind enough to throw these together for me. So um, yeah, they came up real nice. Just a simple logo. And of course, I didn't get it in focus, but what are you going to do? And last but by no means least, applying the oak feet to the speaker. So these are ones I've cut on a table saw at work. And I've just printed off on a piece of A4 either side of the speaker and then sticking it down so it makes my life really easy to work out where the dowel rods need to go. I'm not gluing it for now. I wanted to be able to remove them just in case I wasn't happy with them. And I wanted to um, apply a proper varnish or oil uh, later date when I do the front. But it worked out real well. Just making sure those pilot holes go in perpendicular before removing the paper and uh, doing the proper recess with the 6 mil. Not going all the way through because I'm not gluing it and I don't want air to be able to leak out of it. And Dremel is probably one of the most useful tools I have. I'm not in any way affiliated, but if you haven't got a big workshop, then they're just really good because they're so diverse and it can basically cover off a lot of different tools. So I've got this in the drill press attachment and it works out real nice. Probably, probably a lot easier when you've got it mounted down to a proper desk, but and probably wouldn't probably wouldn't go down well if I did that in my kitchen. And I'm just cutting out the four dowel rods with a junior hacksaw. I get all of the wood, including these dowel rods, from just a local supplier. And it's it's always great to support local ones if you can, because I mean the quality is better. You can see what you're going to get before you buy it, and it, for me anyway, it tends to work out cheaper than if you were to go online. And paying homage to the measure twice, cut once. There you go. By taking the time to print out those pieces was worth it because they both fit in nicely and it's quite a snug fit. So I'm fine to not use glue until I've had the time to take them off and varnish them or oil them or whatever it is I end up doing. With all that said, thank you so much for watching. If you have watched all the way to the end, I really do appreciate it. If you did like this video or got something out of it, then please drop it a like. And if you're here for the first time, I'd really appreciate you subscribing. But for now, I'm just going to leave you with some glamour shots and testing. I've been Johnny Reader. And until next time, keep designing, keep making and keep on creating.